I'm Charles, and I'm on a mission to find what's inside everything. To help me get my answers, I have an industrial CT scan. It takes a whole bunch of x-ray images from all around a subject, and then builds a 3D model revealing every internal detail. Today, we're looking at a pair of bone conduction headphones. We'll get them fixtured up real quick and run a scan. In situations where traditional headphones might be unsafe or uncomfortable to wear, these bone conduction headphones that sit against your skull and jiggle your bones to play music are an alternative that leaves your situational awareness open and your hearing protection unimpeded. The name bone conduction headphones is pretty badass, but I want to know what makes them work? So let's take a look inside. Got a pair of bone conduction headphones. Now, if you've never used these before, these are supposed to be worn over the ears with the transducers touching just on like the, the stiff bit of your head in front of your ear, you know, your bones. And that way, when these vibrate, they can transmit the sound directly into your ear. These are the cheapest ones that we could get off of Amazon. We bought these for a project way back when, when we just needed some futuristic looking headphones. What's going on inside these? Hey, that looks pretty good. Looking at the backside first, we can see we have tactile switch. Either or both of those could be an LED. And then on the back side, we have a transducer. Now this is soldered directly to the board, which, okay, I'd say that's a good decision. And this doesn't exactly look the same as a regular speaker. Let's bump in an ROI on this and see if we can just eke out any more resolution. As you can hopefully see, this surface transducer is split into two parts. We have, well, the stationary part, which I guess we can call the stator. And then we have the moving part, which I'm gonna call the, well, I can't call it the rotor, but let's call it the jiggly boy. The jiggly boy is actually free to move a fairly significant distance here. You can see how this roof is, I don't know, maybe half a millimeter away from it. It can move out a full millimeter and it could move in until, well, these parts touch, which is a, pull, which is a full 0.7 millimeters. Ordinarily, in a speaker, to get the best possible response, you wanna have your speaker cone weigh as little as possible. So you'll actually have the permanent magnet in the stationary part, and then your moving part will have your coil in it, because the coil gives a lot more magnetic field per unit weight than the permanent magnet does. Here, they flip that on its head. Because to get the biggest response in terms of vibration, you wanna be moving the biggest possible thing. And the rest of the chassis is gonna weigh plenty to get the job done. So we actually have our permanent magnet right here in the movie boy. The permanent magnet and the electromagnetic field from the coil are gonna actually create the relative motion. So as the jiggly boy moves in and out under the forces of this field, well, the thing that's applying the field due to Newton's second law, <laughs> due to Newton's third law, not his second, when this jiggly boy moves in or out or is pushed on by the coil, it'll have to push right back. And in doing so, it's gonna make the entire chassis of the headphones shake in and out. Well, because they're already preloaded against your head, that's gonna actually appear as an inward and outward vibration against the sides of your head. And that transmits into your ears. We should hope to be able to find some sort of restoring spring built into this. Cause I mean, if we just hold this and shake it, we don't feel anything moving in there. And with a total free excursion of two millimeters, I kind of expect to hear something moving in there if it was moving. So, through the speaker, through the fire, through the flames, there it is. Here's what's giving us our restoring force. This spring is attaching the stator to the jiggly boy via these long sweeping arms. And those are gonna have, well, probably about half a millimeter of flex available in them to move in and out. That's gonna make sure that the jiggly boy never, you know, overextends and hits something, which could cause damage and also wouldn't sound good and also force it to remain roughly in the middle where you have equal amounts of inward and outward swing available. And all of that is happening with a piece of material that is, to put it mildly, stupidly small. <laughs> we can actually zoom in and find that that is a 0.2 millimeter thick spring. Cool, cool. Let's see, any other fun parts? One cute little detail I'm noticing. The wires that are passing from our transducer into the circuit board are actually kind of bent and wiggly to form some springs. So you see that little structure there? That is just pressing a soldered contact against the backside of the transducer. So on the backside of the transducer, how there are copper pads overlaid on some part, and then two tiny little wires snaking off to actually form the stator of the surface transducer. Oh yeah, and sure enough, right here, we can actually see some current limiting resistors for those LEDs over here. It's all coming together. Now while we're also in this perspective, we can see what's actually giving us the clicky button here. 
Well, the button is actually this whole free-floating assembly of multiple parts. And this outermost one is translucent, so that LEDs can shine through it. And where are those LEDs? They're in here somewhere. That's backed onto this membrane that is going to provide a little bit of extra motion and also a bit more diffusion for the LEDs, and also a degree of waterproofing and sweatproofing, because something like this, yeah, you're really going to want it to be sweatproof. It's just glommed against the side of your head the whole day. And then finally, this impinges through this little protuberance directly onto that tactile switch from earlier. Let's look inside of the right-hand side. Instead, we find, well, all of our electronics on a little circuit board. We can make out a couple of devices here. Uh, I am going to need to speculate a little bit. So we've got two large ICs and a third, much smaller IC. One of these is going to be our Bluetooth controller and the microcontroller for the entire system. The other is going to be an audio amplifier. We have two magnets and then these four contacts that the magnets can approach from. And each one of those, now each one of these charging contacts has a little step. And that step is there so that this can be cast into the frame around it and form a nice rigid mechanical connection. Because if that pin deflects down into the chassis, your magnetic connector isn't going to be able to make an electrical connection to it. Then, either side, two fairly hefty magnets. Let's see, do they... Yeah, I'm not hanging this from it anytime soon, but there's an amount of magnetism in there. And that's really all that's happening on the back side of this, other than the connection to the right earpiece. This assembly right here, that's kind of dangling off near the edge of the circuit board. You can actually see, bottom, this tiny little zigzag. So, signal comes in over the airwaves, gets received by our chip, gets turned into an analog signal, gets sent to our amplifier, and that amplifier sends a signal over to this, or two of these. That's everything there is to know about how these are put together, I think. Thank you guys so much for coming along, and I'll see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave us a like. And if you want to see inside of something, leave a comment with your suggestion. If you want to support the channel, share this video with a friend, or check out hacksmith.store. And if you want to see inside of everything, get subscribed.